the first half of the year of 2017 is already gone, right? June 1st was kind of that, that middle point. What have you realized this year so far, whether it's in your personal life or your career? What do you make of it? I think 2017 is a year of redefinition. You said a year for redefining whatever it is that you want. I think that's different than previous years where there was such a construct that you had to stay skewed in a specific vein or a specific lane that you want worry in. But now in 2017, it's the year where you can say, hey, I want to do this and I'm going to make this happen. And some people are redefining themselves. Some people are coming back to their roots. People are returning to what it is that they're known for. And some people are taking routes to go different directions. Me personally, I just think like, uh, you know, I'm a real dad this year. I felt it. I, my kids are older. I have four kids. Mm. Uh, so I felt like dad this year. And this was a different year than going out, you know, just looking at it from a specific personal accomplishment year. I, I This is the year that I've had my children's goals in mind with how can I help them reach their goals through the work that I'm doing. And uh, it made me look at my career differently. It made me look at... Uh, you know, just things that are out there. And it is in the industry specifically, um, it's just interesting to see, uh, you know, what you want. You start thinking about legacy. This is a year about people defining their legacy. And it's interesting to see some artists like DJ Khaled and how he's taken his son and made his son a, a major part of what his operation and what he's doing it for. Then it kind of makes you take a step back and say, well, damn, this is what you're doing this for. You're really not doing this for you because whatever you paramount to you really won't see the downside of that really you you're gonna go and you're gonna leave what you've worked so hard for to someone and that is your children so theoretically you're working for them to make what they're gonna do in their life a little bit easier mm. and I, I look at you know jay-z and with his children with blue with everybody and their children it's like well wow i knew these artists when they were struggling to get the world to know who they are and now you see them take a turn and say no yeah you know me but everything i'm doing is for my kids and then i started having a lot of self-reflection for that and i was like well what can i pass on because if i'm gone i clearly can't just be on stage bringing that money in so it's like how do i pass this legacy on residually um and so what i started thinking was was like okay i can do this by basically creating a label and basically procuring content through music or through comedy performances that can be sold and redistributed after I'm gone and then now we have a legacy of curating with a certain idea in mind. Mm. So that's what I, I took for the first half of the year. Like definitely was a year for like self-reflection and redefinition. Like, hey, let's start over and really look at how can we fine tune what we're doing to reach the next level. You know, something I don't really talk about in interviews and, and what you just brought up is a good point and I'm curious to see what your thoughts are, if you even have this already or not, but what about your thoughts on life insurance, a will, stuff like that, since you do have yeah, a large family? Yeah, I think family. that's one of the things that that was, was on my mind for this year was just like, I, I knew previous years that mor my mortality was, was, was not infinite. You know, you, you, you get that when you turn like 30. If you're smart, you start waking up saying, hey, you know what, I could die. I could die any moment. What, what's gonna be the plan for how this works? Like, how am I gonna get buried? Clearly being in entertainment versus working in a corporate setting, those things aren't really thought out. It's kind of like, we doing it, we doing it right now Rah, 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 rah. But what about when the grinding ceases? Like when the sound, when everything slows down, what's that going to be? What does life look like on that side? And uh, it's definitely something that I've been pulling together this year. It's just like what I want to pass on, what my legacy is going to be, um, different ideas for stuff that I want to try and pass on to my kids and leave for my wife to have after I'm, I'm done. Because, uh, you know, they're with you through all of the ups and downs anyway. So once you, you get past the downs and you're on the upside, it's like, well, how do I leave something cemented that you can hold on to and at least springboard you to the next level for this 
you know, upside of their life. How young were you when you had your first child? Uh, I was 28. Oh, okay. So I started a little bit late, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I, had, I definitely could have had kids before that. Uh, <laughs> Most guys in today's times are having kids before 28, yeah. their first child. Yeah, and I think it helped me, you know, figure out who I was first. Because sometimes you have kids really early, you don't know who you are, and then you get lost in your kids, and then you're 38 or 40, and now your kids are grown up and they don't need you no more, and then you're trying to figure out who the hell you are. Mm. That's interesting. It's real interesting to see guys turning up in the club because their kids are in high school now, and they don't really have any level of responsibility, but just not kill themselves <laughs> it's just interesting it's an interesting thing to see you know emptiness like kids go to college kids are grown like after 12 13 your kids really don't care about you anymore they just hey keep food let's keep shelter i'll <laughs> stay i love you uh but it's about me now now having four kids do you ever look at your kids like an investment though like because one of your kids could be a genius. They could be an That's inventor. They, they could, could be, be the they next. They could be anything that they want to be. And I think th here's the thing it's getting to know them enough to be in a position to, to help them go in the direction that they would like to go in. I think that's the thing. Sometimes it's, some cult and it's a cultural thing. Culturally, different cultures have outlook. I know uh, East Indian culture, some. Most of their marriages are arranged. They, the parents pick the wife. They know what type of woman it is, not because they're going to take good care of their child, but in their culture, that mate takes care of the parents. Mm. You know, when the parents get a certain age, they move in with the kids, and the kids take care of them, and that's their retirement. Right. That's their ROI on what it is. And, I mean, I, I mean a great concept, great construct, you know, and uh, it helps with, how they pick, but then that's different than Western culture with having free will to choose the person, falling in love, that whole thing. And I mean, like, all of that, it plays a part in who you end up becoming. So I guess for me, I think now it's like, they are investments, and I think the investment is to make sure that they can achieve what it is they want to achieve in this life without, without anything really standing in the way of them but their own work, you know. Previously, it might have been financial, like, oh, shit, I can't, I can't do this. I don't got the money to go to college. Uh, my parents couldn't pay for me to go to school. So I knew to go to college, I needed to get scholarships on my own versus, you know, thinking that my parents were going to pay it. They just couldn't. Now, um, it's interesting because most times when I have a conversation like this, it's from a perspective of a young person who ha or an older person who had kids when they were young. But... You having kids at 28, uh, and you've got four kids now, do you look back, uh, and if you could do it all over again, what would have been an appropriate age for a guy in today's times to have a child? Well, here's the thing. I look at it in relationship to how my dad had me. See, my dad had me when he was 22, 21, 22. So we were able to grow up in a space where it was still fun. You know what I mean? Like. I could, I could play with my dad. I, I played sports with my dad. I did different things with my dad. And so you don't want to be too old. And then, because some things like getting up in the middle of the night. When you're in your 30s and late 30s and 40s, that ain't some shit you really want to do as a man. You want to you hear a crying baby in the middle of the night. You kind of want to have some peace and be able to say, okay, you know, the kids are, can, can, can have a normal sleep schedule. But when you have little kids, they require a lot of attention, a lot of time. You know, I would have loved to have my kids older so that as I'm doing this, I could, you know, do things differently. But then I don't feel bad about it because, well, a lot of my grinding is while they're young, so when they get older, I'm in a more solid position so I don't have to be gone so much. You know, I don't want to be gone when they're 8, 9, and 10, when they really, 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 really need you because that's the formidable years I think that you really start forming who this person is. You know, they have personality traits at like five and six, but like eight, nine, and 10 cements who they're gonna be in high school, and ultimately the high school projects you to who you're gonna be in life through college, sure. if that's what you choose to do. So I know the majority of the major lessons of understanding came when I, you know, eight to like 12 or 13, because really once a time you're 14, you, you pretty much are who you're gonna be in life. So, Moderately, personality-wise. So is 28, 
a good time for a young man in today's times to have a child a little younger, a little later? Here's what I could say. I would say... And everybody's different, of course, where they grow up. And every, and everybody is different. I would say the time to have a child is when you have the right woman who you want to spend the rest of your life with. That's when you do it. If you're not set to spend the rest of your life with the woman, don't have a kid. Unless you, even if you're rich, I can't say finances would necessarily make having a child easier with somebody. Really? Because you still have to deal with that person. And it's important for the child to see both parents and deal with them in a, in a, in a, in a good light. So I'm going to say, whenever you feel like you're with the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with and you committed to try and make that work for them forever, that's the person and that's the time to do it. If you're not certain about that, like 100%, like, yo, this is it, don't do it. If you have any equivocations about or hangups or setbacks that you think, no, this ain't the person, then don't do it. Now, I don't know if this was done on purpose. I don't know George Clooney like that. I don't know his personal life. I don't know if he had health issues or whatever. He did this career-wise on purpose, but he had a child, his first child, I think at like 45 or 46 or something like that. That's just, he's rich. <laughs> and he's like, you know what? I can take the rest of it. It's ain't so much as quantity of time as it is quality of time. And I think for him, for most people, you're gone 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day to work a job away from your kids. So you're really not there with them anyway. Hmm. Versus, hey, I'm going to be gone for three months. And then for the rest of the year, I'm going to be here dropping you off at school, picking you up, going to lessons with you, spending time with you, talking to you, enjoying you, not worried about how can I feed you and provide for you. And that's that's a different level of parenting because who's to say his approach is wrong? Like, he's going to get, he's 45, at 45, you know he's going to at least make it to like 70, provided nothing tragic happens. That's 30 solid years of quality time with a person. You mm. really raised this person. Versus, you know, I I had a you had a kid at twenty four or twenty five, and the majority of their life to your fifty is trying to pay for stuff. How much time do you really get to spend with them? You know what I mean? Like kids get out of school at three o'clock. Like if you're not off work at three, and then the kids go to bed at like nine, eight or nine. Well, there's only six hours a day you really spending with that kid. Mm. Then you have to look at the teachers that are spending most of the time with your child and more than you are. Mm. So it's like, how do you, when you compare that, you just have to look at it with what you know his financial situation is. I mean, for God's sakes, he's a philanthropist now trying to raise money for world issues. So you definitely know he's got time to sit and think about spending it with his kid. So it's all about approach, you know? I imagine the maturity rate and the knowledge is, is at a different level, too, because he's older, so 45 right. years and old. And then he's dealt with so much stuff, and his knowledge base is, di is, is there. So now, as far as being a kid, is his kid going to be a fuck-up? We still don't know that, because we know his kid, plenty of kids out here that had the world at their fingertips and, and blew it. Like, you got to find that balance, because the world is, world is a tough place, man. I have four daughters, so I have no son. Mm. So guys, the people always tell me, oh man, you know, you, you know what that means, you know, you going, you know, this, 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 this is payback. I'm like, no, nah, not exactly. I look at it as though like, hey, it takes a certain type of person, a certain type of man to raise a woman, much less four. You're shaping the minds of, a, of four people who will raise a generation of people. Like, that's a heavy responsibility. Four daughters, does that run in your family? Well, I'm the only son. My dad only had one son, so I had two sisters. And my dad is the only son of his dad's kids. Mm. His dad had three daughters, one son, and I have just straight four daughters. Now, have kids changed your comedy or your direction of comedy? You know, what's, what's funny is I think my kids made me funnier. Oh, wow. I don't think I, I don't think until I had kids, I don't think I was that funny at all. Mm. I think I was just saying shit. And then it was like I had no depth. Kids gave me, my kids gave me depth. And their moms gave me depth. Um, I have two kids with my wife and two kids before my wife. So coming into that situation was interesting because when my wife met me for the first time, 
I had two kids in my life, you know what I'm saying? Like from day one. And interesting enough, interesting enough, my wife is the only woman my kids have ever seen me with. Mm. So it's, I, they don't have any recollection of me with their moms like that, you know? So all they know is me and my wife. So that's simple and plain enough, but it definitely shaped me to be, to, to reach a different, a, I felt a broader sense of existence and it, it also helped me go deeper into like, okay, this is funny, but like, yo, down here, this is, yo, this is a different level of fun. I'm sure it gave you plenty of material too. Oh man, it gave me so much. And I mean, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It's a daily thing that you get. You get uh, information and inspiration from these kids. Did your wife have kids of her own? No. Wow. So. That's interesting. Yeah, none of my kids' moms had other kids when, that, when we had our kids together. I was the first with all of them. Do your kids watch your shows? Do they watch your comedy oh, stuff? Oh, yeah. My your material? She, hey, yeah, they, they pull it up. They watch it. And you know what? As a parent, I'm like, well, no, you shouldn't watch this. No, you shouldn't hear this. But then I'm just like, well, what exactly am I saying? I'm like, you know what? This is who I am. And they should know that this is who, this is, I want to share this with you. This is entertainment. This is, this is writing. This is art. And I think it should be appreciated as such. And that's what makes me say, if I'm going to do something on stage, I want it to be of high quality. Where when my kids see this, they can be like, yo, my dad was funny, but he was really, really dope. I liked how he thought about things. And now I understand. Like, I want them to look back and be able to watch me if I'm gone and be able to watch the show and feel like, yep, that's dad. And that, like, that raises a level of responsibility about what you talk about on stage, too. Do they have aspirations of comedy themselves? Or? Uh, my, my oldest little girl, she wants to make YouTube videos, which mm. is very funny. This is interesting enough. She's like, oh, I want to do this. So she does little stuff like she plays with toys. She does little voices. So my oldest, she does that. Um, one of my daughters is very, very... All of them are very outgoing. I can say that. All of them are very outgoing. I know for sure that they're going to have blossoming personalities throughout whatever they choose to go into. And I can see it. I'm like, okay, I can see this being something big for you. Some of those kids on YouTube have huge fan bases and followings on their channels. You know why? Because they never lost fans. People can don't lose. They, but we have the struggle of, I guess for me, being 34 now, cell phones didn't hit me until I was exit in high school and then they were so expensive everybody couldn't afford them mm. so I went through high school theoretically without a cell phone I didn't get that till college and then cell phone technology was coming in the internet was there but it was kind of like well you had to be at home on your PC at home mm. to be on the internet and that kind of limits where you engage at you still had to interact and engage with people in person and that way you can see the go in a room with people who that aren't millennials and listen to the conversation the noise level mm. Because the, the talking is there. The communication is there. The chatter is there. Go in a room full of millennials. Like, wait, it's 40 people in there? Because everybody's on their phone. Totally missing it. This generation is the first generation to not have more sex than the generation prior to them. That speaks a lot. Is, that, is that a good or bad thing? I think it's bad. Anytime <laughs> sex is on a decline, we're getting closer to extinction level here. Because without sex, there's no babies. Without babies, there's no people. Without people, there's no way to defend. Hey, hey we, we, we got to get the fucking. We got to do it. It feels like so many people have multiple children, though, like yourself. Like, you have four kids. Yeah, I mean. I, that's, not a, that's not abnormal nowadays. I, you you got to give yourself a chance. Somebody's going to be a fuck up, potentially, you know? Got to accept that. Somebody might just be a turd. And it's okay. You accept it. You're like, hey, I'm not going to hang all this pressure on you. That wasn't your job. But How far apart are the kids in their ages? Six, five, two, and one. Holid holidays, birthdays, oh. easy or hard for you? Uh, I think holidays is always a fun time. Christmas is nuts. But not hard remembering everybody's birthdays? and. No, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. No, no. My oldest two, their birthday is three days apart, different year, three days apart. They're both they're both Aries, and then my uh, third daughter, she is a Aquarius, and my baby girl is a Gemini. 
So it's cool. Got their own. Little, everybody got their own little space. <laughs> now three different mothers. Three. And good terms with all the mothers, or yeah, for the most part. For the most part. For the most part. That's I mean, there's there's people. I love them all. There's love there for everybody. Hey, I wish everybody would. Do they? Go ahead. Do they? Do they what? Do they get along with each other? For the most part, I mean, still three different women, three yeah. different personalities, you know. And I think I think it's growing to be, you know, you grow through things, you know. That's part of being a parent as an adult. You're still maturing, like we talked about earlier. It's like, hey, you know, certain things that you would do at 27, you mm-hmm. wouldn't do necessarily at 34 or 35. And it's, it, I think, it's growing exponentially, and it's grown exponentially. And I think. Uh, it's a dope thing, man. It's like they communicate, they're able to talk to each other, articulate, share. That's all you can ask for. That sounds healthy. Now, easy or hard maintaining a comedy career? Hard. And having a child? Easy. Easy because the <laughs> child gives you jokes. Hard because it's just comedy is hard. Oh, okay. I get it. it it's, it, there's, okay. Theoretically, there used to be a, a blueprint that you would go to. You would be like, okay, in the 80s, in the 70s, you needed to do stand-up. And be good enough to get on Johnny Carson. Be good enough on Johnny Carson so Johnny invites you to sit on the couch. You sit on the couch, America gets to know you, you're a success. You get movies, everything happens. Boom. Then that went away. When Carson went away. Then it was, all right, write an act, have a point of view, work the circuit. Get work in the circuit. Eventually get noticed by a good agent, a good manager. A good agent, a good manager gets you in front of television. You have a pilot. The pilot gets picked up. You're on TV. You get a sitcom. Success. Now it's different because TV's orders and appetite is different. Well, before when it was just a pool of comedians that you would com- com- compete against for comedic material and stuff like that, you got a whole onslaught of people from the internet, which it's open, open, fair game to anybody. Then you got to think about people with reality television. They weren't going against that. Mm. Those time slots that reality television shows have used to be for sitcoms. Yep. And now they're like, well, it's cheaper just to do this show. I can do this reality show and not have to pay the residuals. The network wins. Everybody wins. We can still sell these commercials for this amount during this slot of garbage. <laughs> and... I mean, the only person who loses is that is a viewer, because the viewer ingests this, and then this is perceivably real life to them, but it's stage life, which I don't understand why they just don't write a show instead of doing this, but I get it. Um, And then you blow up these people. You blow up these people who are using their real name and their real life and real story points. But the problem is people can't check out of the character. The, the artist doesn't check out of the character, nor does the fan check out the character. And then ultimately, unless the character plays a fan favorite to be the, uh, you know, protagonist, then you, you lose. Like, you get this convoluted sense of fan, fanhood to where people can't appreciate you stepped into a role. They're like, oh, you're this type of person in real life. Screw you. You ain't shit. Blah, 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 blah. Well, nobody really wins with that because everybody seemingly is going to do something that that isn't cool or that doesn't make sense versus a character. It's like, oh, you play this character. Ha, 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 ha. Or you're really mean on that show. Ha, 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 ha. But I know it's a character versus, oh, this is who you really are. Shame on you. Boo, I hate you. And then the artist when the show's over, they don't just get to shed that shell. They're, they're stuck as that forever. And then people in the industry are like, oh, you're really a shitty person. I don't like you. Mm. Or you're a bimbo. Or you have zero talent. Or why are you even famous? And then it's, that's what it is. Very interesting observation. Man, now- two, of my, two of my kids' moms have come from reality television. One was on Bad Girls Club, one was on Love of Ray J and some other shows, and she's done other work, done movie work. And it wears on them. Mm. You you don't shed that. I mean, it's cool. You can try and keep your fan base, but then it's like, what are they really fans of? 
These are now a bunch of people who are following your every move personally instead of professionally. And so you have to keep feeding them if you want your fan base to grow. But then it's like, well, how do you transition and switch gears and hit the next level? It's, it's harder. It's a harder thing to make it from that. Now, you have opportunities where people know who you are immediately, so you see a lot of spinoff business, boutiques, uh, selling hair, uh, selling clothes, selling shoes, doing makeup, doing personal appearances. But in this industry, it's hard enough with talent that you can share and, and do. If you're a musician, you know, it's, there's an outlet for that people know who you are now you can put this out versus well you are talented but I don't like you because I don't like you personally because mm -hmm. of this situation but this storyline is fictitious seemingly because they arrange things so that you're face to face with your worst enemy it's like well that ain't normal if, if Gotti ain't finna go sit down and have uh, dinner with young Dolph and argue at the table and throw by that's just not how that works mm -hmm. that's not reality nobody's gonna you're hardly ever going to sit across the table from someone you hate with that much animosity. And definitely to think of it as something that's going to be televised that you're going to talk through to try and really resolve a real issue and then have an interview about what you thought had happened and then you get to watch that back. It's like you never get to grow out of it. You never get to put it behind you. Like just imagine the best and worst of you just broadcast across the screen. Well, it's hard. Some days you're a dickhead. I'm a dickhead. I'm an asshole a couple, some days, sometimes. I know I am, but I don't have it shot out across the world on television. So it's it's a weird place. It's a weird thing. And I, I took my hat to anybody. I don't I don't have any beef with anybody in reality television. I, I don't have any beef with anybody personally in my life. I just want people to make it and get to where they're trying to get to and to be inspired to keep going. That's it. But it's hard. Having four kids... As you've been having one child, and then another, and then a third, then a fourth, does that get easier for you or harder? After two, after having two kids, it gets easier. Because then you, you're, not, you're not a novice at having one. They actually entertain each other. You can leave them, they can play with each other. They mm -hmm. can engage each other. Versus, well, you gotta give me attention. Well, they can get attention from each other. They can play. They can be distracted in themselves, in their own world. And then you get easier. It's, it's just like anything, repetition. It's just like somebody who runs a daycare. They're good at running a daycare because they repetitiously know how to deal with children. And that's what you become. You're like, okay, I know this. I know that I, I want to get the kids up early so they get tired easier earlier to go to bed earlier. Versus, well, I'm going to let the kids sleep longer, but then they're up in the, the later part of the night and it's harder to settle them down. How do you get kids settled for bed? Got to get it quiet. Got to get it dark. Got to get it cozy. Got to make sure they're full. Got to make sure they're clean. <laughs> you bathe them, not just because you don't want them to be dirty, but you know once you know that water relaxes anybody, then digestion. I tell people all the time, you got to know about digestion. Mm. A full stomach of food, your body has to digest it. Digestion takes work. It is a tiresome process. Uh, once that happens for a little baby, they're going to go to sleep. But if there's nothing there to digest, then they're just awake, and then they're, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, an empty stomach. An empty stomach. Yes. Think about how easy you fall asleep with a full stomach. Oh, yeah. Now, um, okay, having multiple children, three, four, like yourself, what's the best thing about having multiple kids? With, with multiple kids just in general? Or yeah, in general kids? speaking. Oh, man, I mean, you just get to get the sense of love of your of who you are and what you stand for in a room you walk in a room and it's just like yo all of you used to be in my nutsack at one point in time this is the coolest shit ever it's like you're standing there and it's like i can't wait till they have kids because then you can just be like yo if it wasn't for me none of you motherfuckers would be here i did this you know with god's help and your woman of course but definitely started with your thought you know Hardest thing about having multiple children? Um, feeling like you want to give them more when you can't. Wanting to give them more individual time, individually, because everything is such a collective effort. I try to do little stuff with each one of them on their own. Play with them individually. Do this. Any general advice, any 
do's or don'ts, somebody watching this and uh, having multiple children or having to deal with multiple baby mothers, uh, any advice there? Uh, Either daddy. or. <sighs> some baby daddy rules, some do's and don'ts. Your yeses need to be yeses and your noes need to be noes. And you should live and die with knowing what those things are. Uh, if you're not going to give your kid's mother 110% in a relationship, cut it off. Because whether your relationship works out or not, you still got to raise a kid together. So it's best to not taint the parenting world with distrust, because I've been through that. Mm. Man, then it's also good to have clear boundaries when you have, when you're a baby daddy. You're like, hey, this is your space. This is my space. This is the kid's space. This is what we do. This is what we don't do. We agree. I mean, not so much rules and laws because first thing somebody's going to say is, all right, if you're a guy, you have to accept, if you're not going to be with this woman, you have to then be the number one fan for her finding somebody to fall in love and be with. If you can't do that, then you got some issues you got to work out for yourself. You selfish mm. and you ain't shit. Um, you got to let that go. It's not, I don't care. You can say you the best, it don't matter. You, you have to want that because that's the natural progression and order of any household structure. She should, n she should not be alone and go through things every day. You almost have to prepare that situation for somebody else is going to be there when you're not. There's, there's no way around it. It's not that you absent. It's just that there's no way. You can live in the same city, live in different cities, live in the same street, but there's still going to be two households that are going to be run. And if you're cohabitating in, cohabitating in multiple households, Without, a, without an understanding that, hey, that's what's going to happen and everybody's cool with it, you can go religious. You can talk about it in the Quran. Eh? Allah says you can have multiple wives, but you have to treat them all equally, but one is best. It's the reason why he said one is best. I ain't saying you can't do it. I ain't saying it's, it's wrong if you do because there are women who are built and engineered to be able to Sustain it. It's been going on since the beginning of time. But childbearing is the only true contract you have to consummate two people. It's That's it. They're, they're, you can't duplicate that. You can't fake that. Like, it takes a male set of genes, a female set of genes, you put them together, and that is the consummation of your relationship. The marriage you can dissolve. Because it's not the old days when you get divorced, you get stoned and it's over. Mm -hmm. So it's like that's the true consummation of two people. And so you got to respect what that means and understand what that means today versus yesterday. Uh, hey, man, you got to give your last. You got to be prepared to sacrifice. I can tell you a lot of times I've had some successful moments where I've seen true success and seen money, but it all goes to my kids. I ain't really be able to do that shit that I want to do, like, you know, throw money at the strip club all the time. Mm. I mean, I might throw forty dollars, but then <laughs> I know it's forty dollars. It ain't like I'm making it rain thousands of dollars, and my children is starving. No, I, don't, I can't. I can't do that. Plus, I just feel like I know too many strippers that I personally, if I want to invest in their life, this is something. <laughs> but anyway, uh, makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. You ever thought about writing a book on this stuff? You, you know so much about it. You sound like a experienced vet and you know what you probably giving me a good idea maybe I should I think I should I was hoping for another pinnacle of success that I was gonna get to but maybe it lasts now it's kind of like Steve Harvey he wrote his book and then everybody was like well you sucked in relationships <laughs> but it's kind of like LeBron I'm jumping around you stay are. with me you are but stay with me <laughs> Do you not acknowledge the fact that he's been there and done that? Sure. Is it necessarily about the win? Do you learn more from winning or do you learn more from losing? I've learned more from losing in my life than I have from winning. Very good point. You don't learn shit when you win. You just know you won. And you know that winning feels good. What else do you take away from a win? Oh, you won. So, okay, okay, mission accomplished. What do you learn from losing? So much more depth. I've lost so much in my life. I've lost. I was on a competition show for comedy 
on TBS with Marlon Wayans. I got runner up. And in my head, I knew I was better than everybody that I played against or competed against. And I knew I was, I knew that. And to lose, it was like, okay, you lost. And then you lost in front of everybody. How do you, I know what that, I know what that car ride home is like. I know what it's like to get in a big game and feel like, damn, I had a shot at everything and I lost it. So to lose, I, I, you could ask my kids' moms. I think some days they'll say he's a great dad. Some days they'll be like, yeah, he sucked at being a baby daddy this day or I hated him for this. And it was things I had to grow through. And I'm only telling you this because I'm speaking from a position of reality. Like, I actually did this. Learn. Why do you listen to people who've been in jail? To not go to jail. It's not to say, oh, you fucked up, you stupid, you got caught. No, that's what can happen. You, it can not go the way you want it to. Any plans for more children, or is this it? No, I definitely want a son. So what happens if you have another child and it's a daughter? <laughs> Are you going to uh, keep trying to I'm actually, son? I'm actually, I've been doing a lot of research uh, in what's out there. With money, anything is possible. Oh, you really want this son. I do. And I mean, I there's, tell. there's upsides and a downside to the shit. You know, it's like, if it was just designed for me to have all girls, you know, that you can theoretically bypass that with... They take your sperm, they extract it, and then they spin it, and they spin it with eggs, and the ovulated egg ends up become, becoming, they can use temperature to make the chromosome drop to be a boy. <laughs> it's a spinning process. You can look it up online. Um, That's crazy. Usually around like $5,000 to do it, and then you have the insemination process where the woman's inseminated with this fertilized egg that is a boy, that this chromosome is dropped in, and then there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know, they all. You, you, the more money you spend, the more stuff that you can try and do. You can bring out more uh, recessive traits, oh, wow. more dominant traits that you want to get. I've even That's heard crazy. it that you can make them taller. They can <laughs> alter the sperm. They can take the best sperm zygotes and ins- use those for insemination. They, they have all types of different ways in which they can find the best candidate for the job versus the usual old shakeup. 